we're here at the IS meeting in Vancouver. We're here with Joel Gallant, who has uh, been our staunch supporter of information as we disseminate it each year from this meeting, and, and you do such an admirable job. And slightly different role. We'll have a few more things to talk about than just treatment. But uh, treatment is, is, is certainly always covered more prolifically here than at the, the usual, the meeting that happens every other year, mm -hmm. which is more of a uh, uh, behavioral and, and uh, global uh, challenge. It's lots of things going on at that one. This was a smaller meeting, yeah. but it also has the science that's, that's more profoundly, more mm -hmm. st stands out a little more strongly. And, um, but it's the meeting that happens this time of year, so if you want research put out on the table in the peer review process, this is where it happens. Right. So tell us what you grabbed as important. Well, um, you know, of course, there's been a lot of uh, good information about uh, PrEP, about the when to start question coming from the START trial and HPTN 052, uh, the importance of treatment as prevention. <clears throat> but if you want to focus on specific drugs, uh, we, there is still a pipeline, uh, mm -hmm. I'm happy shrinking to say. Shrinking as it is. It may be shrinking, but it's probably more robust than we thought it would be right. uh, at this point. Um, probably the, the drug uh, that got the most attention and that's closest to approval is tenofovir alafenamide or TAF, mm -hmm. which is going to be coming out in a variety of different co-formulations. Um, so uh, TAF is a, another prodrug of tenofovir, just like the, the tenofovir that we use mm -hmm. today, and, but it's thought to have a better toxicity profile because you get higher intracellular levels and lower uh, plasma levels, so the, mm -hmm. uh, it's very clear that it's, prob it's safer for bones. And uh, mm -hmm. although the, the, the kidney data are a little confusing, uh, it's certainly no worse than the current TDF and most likely safer mm -hmm. um, from a, a, a kidney standpoint. Um, and the pill size will be smaller because the dose is smaller. So there'll be a, a version of Strybild, a version of Complera, a version of Truvada um, mm -hmm. uh, with TAF. And, um, We've seen data on using, uh, using TAF in people who already have poor renal function. Um, and it certainly looks like they, they, they maintain stability of their glomerular function and the amount of protein they spill in the urine goes down. That's yeah. encouraging. The, the drugs are <coughs> different than the old days when you get on a regimen that works. Generally speaking, for the most part, you're going to stay on that drug for a very long time, if not uh, you know, 10, 20 years, I mean, possible, but there are drugs that are coming down the line and maybe then we talk also about switching, but, but it's important to understand that these drugs are going to be on board. Yeah. And, and so it's not like you're, you, you, it's a short term. This is a long term. Treatment. Well, I mean, you know, I don't, I can't think of very many patients of mine who have been on the same drug for 10 years, but I tend to be the type, there are switchers and non-switchers in the gotcha. HIV treating community. And my view is if something better comes along, why wouldn't you, right. you know, want to switch to it? Um, other people have the sort of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it uh, mm -hmm. approach. And they're both valid approaches, uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that drugs don't, new drugs these days don't get approved without a reason. They have to, they have, to have always, some advantage over older right. drugs or they wouldn't. It's always the bar get gets set higher, the benchmarks yeah. are higher and so yeah. forth, yeah. I mean, the real question with TAF, I think, is what will happen when, when the current tenofovir goes generic? Because mm -hmm. it's kind of a no-brainer if you've got a current, a, 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 let's say, Strybild that contains TDF, our current tenofovir, mm -hmm. and a new version of Strybild that contains TAF, and they're the same price. Why wouldn't you switch? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, definitely less loss of bone mineral density, probably safer for kidneys, smaller pill size. It's a no-brainer. The the hard part is when TDF is generic and, and much right. less. Now that then it becomes a harder issue because yeah. you're probably going to have to pay a premium if you want to use and TAF, H and H so you may you may end up picking yeah. the person who's got some bone density problems or picking the person who's who's got some kidney problems. You can demonstrate a it. specific need for that particular right, drug. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how do you is is the way you handle? I, I guess just ask this question because you moved from. Um, from Baltimore, is the treatment any different out there in the West than it is in the East? No, um, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you have much certain... the same. I mean, we have a. I, I'm now in a much more rural yeah. uh, state, and so people 
have to often drive long distances to get to to find expert care, which wasn't the case in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so there, are, I think there are a lot of people who are getting care by non non experts because of geography, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes are suffering for for that. Uh, and this is a good segue into our the discussion of the challenges that we face with the, the aging population of the providers. <laughs> the providers. We're always talking I mean, about aging patients, right, but we but don't talk about providers. But you're one of our younger old doctors. <laughs> well, that's, kind of, that's kind of you to say what. <laughs> I, uh, I, I have to say it that way. That's <laughs> one of the younger old doctors. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so many doctors came on board back in the day when, when uh, this disease started, which is 30 some years ago. It's 30, yeah. 30, let's see, 35 years ago. Yeah. It, it, in 1980, it was just beginning. And then when the doctors were seeing, they were in lung, lung area or they were in uh, ID and they, like I say, they gravitated to HIV because that was mysterious and interesting and exciting. And it was a, it was a, it was a calling for many people. Yeah, I think yeah. they went into it because of they, the they felt yeah. that they needed to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's not a calling anymore. It's an interesting field. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting mm -hmm. disease, but it doesn't have that same the, sort of the spiritual drama or the rigor or the, uh, or the uh, yeah. intensity, yeah. Yeah. the grimness that we had back in the old right. days. It's hard to really remember those days in some ways, uh, but we can remember those that have been lost. But it's a it's a challenge to to uh, understand how to uh, navigate the differences in 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 mentally in what we dealt with in those yeah. days yeah. and today. I think. Back when we did the 25th anniversary and we had uh, Jim Curran talking about it, some of those were tear-jerking moments. Yeah, and yeah. I think uh, Mike Sag did a pretty good job at some yeah. point when they did the remembering back mm -hmm. when. But, oh, I, I yeah. often forget what it was like to, to do HIV care in those days until something, a movie or a mm -hmm. reading something, will bring it all back in mm -hmm. a flood of memories. It's, it's, it's amazing pretty, what we've gone through. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I am concerned that um, that people aren't going into this field, both from a research standpoint and a patient care standpoint, as much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, infectious diseases as a subspecialty was often the entree for many people. Not not to say that everybody who took care of, of patients with HIV were ID specialists, but many got their start that way. And now, fewer and fewer people are choosing infectious diseases as their uh, their field. And it's interesting to know, I mean, there are many reasons why that might be, but one of them is that infectious disease specialists are the lowest paid specialists in, in medicine, lower than primary care. So in other words, if you uh, did your internal medicine training and became a primary care doctor, and then you said, I think I'll do uh, three years of extra training to do infectious disease, your salary would drop as a result. Mm -hmm. So you know, at a time when we're dealing with emerging infectious diseases, Ebola, mm -hmm. antibiotic mm -hmm. drug resistance, HIV, uh, this mm -hmm. is how we value that. That's that. Right. And then you have on top of that, you have the stigma, and the the uh, the exceptional challenge. I mean, we always looked at HIV as an exceptional disease, mm -hmm. and we try to normalize it for the patient, but it is still an exceptional disease. Yeah. It has all those other complications. Yeah. And then we have the uh, issues around trying to find the money. To get these specific things taken care of, and uh, and then we have the co-infection with hepatitis. I mean, like it's challenging, and and of course getting into the field, technically I guess, and and brain power. It takes a lot of brain power because this this disease is complicated. It's not you know for the weak at heart or the or the or those that really don't have that that A score. I think we kind of have fooled ourselves by, you know, saying, hey, look how easy HIV treatment is now. It's yeah. one pill a day. There's several options. It's easy. Patients tolerate it. You know, and yes, it's true. It's certainly easier than it used to be. But a lot of mistakes get made by people who think that it's so easy that they can do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see that. I see that all the time with, with those kind of mistakes that wouldn't be made by somebody with expertise. And you must have, I mean, because of your expertise, and I, I really, do, really do value that, I, and you know that, uh, but, I mean, you're at a lot of meetings. I just, not too long ago, I was at a meeting that you presented to a, our, in our community, but uh, you must have calls from doctors that are questioning a, a choice or a question about, mm -hmm. you know, how to make this decision of switching or not, yeah. especially since you're one that's more given to switching than most. Yeah. I think you're, you're, 
you're managing more carefully, so you're, you're going to make those teams. Those <coughs> well, sw I think switching is interesting. You, you know, we used to, I used to give lots of lectures about how do you deal with drug resistance, what do you put somebody on who's heavily resistant. It was very interesting and very complicated, but I never give that lecture anymore because it just is not, a, it's not an issue the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's the issue of should you switch somebody to a simpler regimen and can you get away with it? Why would you do it? Should you do it? And mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting subject because we've definitely seen a few examples of switch studies that were not, you know, where the outcome wasn't good. And it was usually because there wasn't a complete understanding of the past treatment history of that patient. Uh, they just thought, oh, well, here's this new Because we don't know. I mean, people have right. been on treatment 10 years, this drug, and, and they don't, they've never gone back to undetectable again to really... And should yeah. that be a, 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 should you do that risk? Well, I think it depends on the switch. So first mm -hmm. of all, ideally you have a complete history on the patient with yeah. all the resistance data, and then you can make a, an educated choice. That's sometimes easier said than done. I mean, in Santa Fe, we have people who have lived in six or seven different cities before retiring mm -hmm. in Santa Fe, and trying to get all those old records is, is impossible. So they end up on very complex regimens sometimes that they've, come in with and I would love to simplify but I want I want to know that would uh, you go back to detectable and, and, and uh, I don't I this? don't like doing that anymore. I would I would think I, you they're, would, they're, yeah. I don't once somebody's suppressed I don't want to mess with that yeah, yeah. but you know I see two two kind of errors when it comes to switching one is to not to simply not switch and mm -hmm. I've I've seen people on horrendously archaic toxic regimens They've got lipoatrophy, they've got neuropathy, they've got, and, and the doctor says, well, but your viral so. load is undetectable. Well, yeah, but it should but be undetectable with health. anything. <laughs> and, with, and they often, sometimes the patients don't understand that what's yeah. happening to them is a result of these drugs. The other mistake is just willy-nilly random switches for, without any thought mm -hmm. to whether the drugs are going to be mm -hmm. active in that particular be really person. Careful. So yeah. I think that that's, that's the interesting uh, part of HIV medicine now is more than sort of managing treatment failure because we're not seeing a lot of treatment failure. Mm -hmm. So um, what else is there at the conference that, that jumped out at you? I know that the hepatitis was really big, but um, and now we're, of course, wanting to get action. We're saying, hey, people, this is almost a malpractice if you don't put people on treatment. Well, it's, it's like, very, very interesting that we're basically saying you have to have cirrhosis or severe fibrosis to be treated. I mean, that, they're, that they're cannot be at least last, good you know, from that. Yeah, I mean, that's the good crazy. comes from when you treat early. Yeah. I mean, even in with HIV, we never went so far as to say you have to have, your immune system has to be ravaged before you yeah, can be treated. Yeah, yeah. So, have so six opportunistic infections. Together. Yeah, I mean, this is not going to last. There'll be lawsuits, and yeah. uh, but the, luckily there is some price competition, and I, I think we'll we'll probably I think this will get better over time. Yeah, but the time, at least the in pricing the United and States. so forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we seem to always carry the uh, the R and D, and everybody else picks up the the bill, the the uh, creation or the or the uh, manufacture of the of the drugs fairly. But we now know what the price of these drugs are to to build, to, uh, to manufacturers, $100 a year or something like that. It's like incredibly, yeah. or, a, or a, a treatment, I shouldn't say the whole treatment for $100. So well, I don't expect uh, you're going to see that yeah. price. No, I know, but that's, 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 that's Nor not should the, you, because you, we want there to be an incentive for exactly, drug development. Right? Exactly, we don't, but yeah. so there has to be some middle ground there. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, you can make a pretty decent price, but we also have to make sure that, bottom line is we want the people to be treated. Right. So now they're asking the question, how many people in this country do you think is going to be treated? And they don't know because there's no evidence. There's no... There's well, no our, you know, we talk about the HIV cascade and how bad it looks in the United mm -hmm. States of, in terms of, you know, the num number of people infected for those who, don't, who know that they're mm -hmm. infected, mm -hmm. et cetera, on down to those who are suppressed. But the cascade for hep C is much, much worse mm -hmm. in terms of the... The, the percentage of everywhere. people who don't know that yeah. they're they're infected, mm -hmm. and the the recommendation for for routine testing in certain age groups is not really has kind of fallen on deaf ears, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, test and, and now treat right away is, is seems to be. In fact, San Francisco they're doing that very thing. They're testing right. and treating the same day. Right. So I mean that's a, a trial and and uh, it seems to be working very well with at least some 90% of the patients. So. Yeah, and the other thing that doesn't get talked about enough with the hep C, unlike HIV, is the whole idea of treatment as prevention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Santa Fe, I'm treating lots of 
65 year olds who injected drugs back in the 70s mm -hmm. it's great that we're treating them but we're not preventing any cases because they're not spreading the disease mm -hmm. um, the people who are actively spreading HCV can't be treated because the insurance companies say oh he used drugs yeah. he, he took a sip of wine at a wedding no nope, can't treat you know that's we're never going to prevent cases through yeah. treatment if we have that that restrictive it's, attitude it's it's <coughs> unbelievable to see how absolutely opposite the the, uh, the 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 way it is that they are offering the treatment compare, compared to what it should be yeah. yeah it's just hard to imagine yeah well Joel I really appreciate you taking the time it's been always a pleasure great talking to, to, to you visit Fred. with you and, as always and come visit us in Portland again sometime I'd love soon. to yeah